Welcome to module three. So here I'm going to go through the first three objectives of the topographic mapping module and we're going to be talking about elevations on maps. Now in surveying one you will be covering this in the actual surveying mode and you'll also cover this in drafting. So this is taking the mapping perspective on this and um, and going through some of the rules and everything that's associated with it. So the topographic maps are used a lot. Like pretty much every map that you use to like navigate through anything. Um, if you go hiking, you're going to be looking at topographic maps. It, even if you go skiing, you're often looking at topographic maps. Construction uses topographic maps all the time. Waterway management uses it. Um, so topographic maps are a very, very popular, very, very common type of map. And, um, and, and nowadays with everything going digital, like topographic maps are shown in 3D all the time. So any kind of 3D map you look at, like even Google Earth, you know, you go in and you can see buildings on the side and all that. All of that is topographic mapping. So what we're trying to do in here is break it down into the little pieces that you would see with topographic mapping and how to show elevations. So we've talked about scales in the last module. This particular module is now looking at elevations and how those apply. So objective 3.1 is comparing different methods of displaying elevation. So there are five main ways of doing elevation. So some of them say that it says 2D there, but um, some of it it shows in 3D because I can. So the first one is contours. This is like the most popular way of showing elevation. Everyone jumps to contours because it's easy to do with, deal with math. It's easy to measure. It's very clear. We see it a lot. So the contours, very, very common. I'll get into more detail with that. Hillshade, for example, hillshade is showing shadow. So you kind of place a sun somewhere and cast a shadow. Again, it gives this 3D feeling to it. Um, it, it. It really doesn't have any value associated with like the depth of it or anything like that. It's just really showing how shadow casts and giving that 3D feeling. Color is another very common one. So hill shades kind of thrown on top of either contours or color in other ways. Color itself is um, showing every elevation is a different value. It can also show groupings. So for example, here in this example, it does show from light to dark. So we're seeing like the lower values are lighter and then it gets darker as it goes up. So in this case, we actually would call this that every value, every elevation value has a different um, color. But if I just made this all like one, like the lower values all purple, and I just made this purple like a solid color of purple, I can also do that as well. So I just kind of group the, um, I, we call it binning. I could bin my, my elevation values and make them all one color. So you can do both. There's two different ways of doing it. Form lines is a very common engineering way of dealing with this. So it is creating straight lines. You'll often see TINs, which is a triangular network. Um, and you'll see, so you'll see a whole bunch of tri triangles in here. Anything that has to do with straight lines, you can see here in contours that it's rounded and everything's kind of a round curvy way. Some, there's some pointy edges and straighter edges, but it's it, it, like, blends together nicely in contours. In form lines, it is meant to be straight lines. The reason being that in engineering applications, we're often dealing with man-made items. So therefore, we need to have straight lines because it's easier to cut and fill a straight line. So that's why we do form lines. Then we have hatchers. So hatchers is the an older way of doing it because we used to have to show elevation by hand and therefore they wanted to show the slope direction and they wanted to show all of the details and make it look kind of 3D-ish. So that's what hatchers are. So hatchers are these little lines. You can see some contours in here, but these hatchers along here that look like grass, that's actually showing slope direction and showing how steep. So we'll get more into that as I move through the, the slides. So start with hillshade. 
So a halo shade looks like shadowing from the sun. The sun is placed at a particular angle in the vertical and in the azimuth. So azimuth is the direction from the north to cast its light. Sometimes the um, software will automatically choose a, a place to put the sun. And it's like, oh yeah, that looks really nice and everything. But it's put like in like the direct north or something, somewhere that you're not going to normally see a sun. So it really kind of throws things off. So really be careful about where you, that sun is placed um, and that light is cast down to illuminate one side and ca cause shadows on the other. It does provide a sense of depth so we can see how deep it is. We can see you know, where, where kind of that 3D feeling comes from. But there are no numerical values that are derived from it. So you can't go in there and be like, okay, I can calculate this. Because it's not actually going to cast a shadow. It's just going to, because like if you put a tree there, it's not going to show on the bottom. It's not going to like cast it at a certain angle and direction and length. And so you can't really derive anything numerically out of it. It's really just more of a quali quality type of um, project, or not projection, but quali qualitative type of enhancement for for elevation color shading um, we use color like I kind of went into detail we can use it for use one color for a range of elevation values or one color for every elevation values it does allow for approximate numerical values so if I'm trying to show something um, in color then I can I can easily see okay well this grouping is about this or it's approximately this elevation because the color sort of matches to the to to the legend so we can get approximate values with it which is handy generally speaking the, the example I gave you guys there is kind of the opposite but blue is generally the lowest color and pink or white is the highest um, the reason we do that is because blue often represents water and then like pink or red or white. White is like a peak, so it shows like snow. You can think of it that way. Generally speaking, that's what's used. It's not a standard by any sense of the, or any stretch of the imagination, but it's just kind of a general feeling that we try to go for with color shading. The form lines, like I said, used in engineering maps. You'll see it in other maps as well because everyone really jumped on board with the whole idea of tins. So uh, that that's that straight line. They're they're often the the key with form lines though. So form lines have developed from being a straight line along a single elevation value to being kind of straight lines across an entire map. So the original form line is kind of like a contour, except it is a straight line rather than a curvy line. Um, wireframes is a 3D representation, so we take those straight lines and we break them into pieces, um, and so we can represent our, our form lines in a, in a 3D view, but they're no longer along a single elevation at that point um, as we move through form lines. So we, it does allow, the nice thing about form lines is that we get precise numerical values for engineering calculations because they're straight lines. We're not having to deal with natural curvy things. Um, it does provide for a little bit more structure when you're dealing with calculations. So that's why form lines are used quite a bit. Um, drafting is really, they really like form lines. Uh, most drafting software does do form lines uh, and that's kind of their default for even doing what we call contours. Uh, but mapping software, form lines is a special thing, and it's it because it, it's meant for a different purpose. Hatchers, like I said, old way of creating maps. It's being updated to vector maps nowadays. We call them vector maps, and we have lines that go downhill. We we have like little arrows, then they'll point downhill. Nowadays, the, the old way there was no arrows; it was just lines. So the lines are drawn in the direction of the slope. It's perpendicular to where the contours are. The closer the lines are, the sharper the slope, or the steeper the slope, I should say. Um, and there's no numerical value associated with it. It was all done by hand, um, often done in the field. So, because it was right there that they could actually identify it. So the, and, but they were like, they took forever. They were really, really a, a challenge to put together. So be thankful you don't have to do them anymore, but you need to be able to read them because you'll see them in field notes from um, like township field notes, which 
are also known as split line notes. So you're going to see those. You're also going to see them on township plots. So when we get to those, you're, you will see them. So contours. Contours can be a very big topic. Uh, just because there's so much involved in them and there's like a lot of different definitions that go with it and everything else, you'll see in your workbooks, activity books, that, uh, that there is a, um, I think it's a word scramble for you guys. And so go through that and take a look at the different rules around contours. And you don't have to memorize every single one, but at least know a few of them. So lines drawn, so a contour is a line drawn along a single elevation. So if I have an elevation of 100 meters, everywhere that it is 100 meters, that's where the line is connecting. It's often curvy and irregular to look realistic at, and, and in natural areas specifically. So as soon as you're in the city, contours are not as curvy or and irregular. Uh, but if you are out anywhere else other than the city, it's going to look a lot more natural and kind of really very irregular. Men-made stuff, we like to have structure, we like to have control, we like to have things very straight. So therefore everything becomes regular looking rather than irregular. So there are three different kinds of contours that we have to worry about. There's index contours, also known as reference contours. And those ones are the labeled ones on a map. Um, usually they're thicker than other contours, so you can read them easier. Or they might be a different color, they, but they're definitely labeled, or every other one's labeled depending on the map. It also indicates what direction is uphill or downhill. Good example, of that. and really what's key with contours is if the words are pointing the top of the word, or the top, not word, but let, uh, number, that's what I was looking for, the top of the number. So if it tells me that it is, you know, 900 meters, the top of the nine is actually reading uphill. So if I turned it upside down, the nine, it, like to me, if it's upside down, the bottom of the page or below it is actually the uphill rather than the downhill. So, um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more after, but that, that's what an index contour is, is it tells me which way is up or down and it tells me what the, the value is at that index contour. It's usually a very round number and it makes it easier for us to find um, values on the map. Then in between index contours, there are intermediate contours that are in between the index contours. There are always four intermediate contours between each, uh, like the two index contours. These ones are not labeled, but they are still representing the contour interval, which I'll get to. So the, the, the intermediate contour you can imagine is broke up into five pieces and each of those pieces is identified through an intermediate contour. So the base contours is the starting point of the map. Really the standard base value of a contour is zero. We always start at mean sea level or whatever the zero value is. So, um, the reason we do that is because it makes it so much easier to, uh, it makes it easier for us to remember that my, in, my index contours are always going to be round numbers or easy numbers to read. And it also allows us when we go to create contours that we're not starting at some weird value. Like, so for example, if I'm going through and you see, oh, my lowest point on my map is 937.45 meters. You're not starting there. That, that, that's crazy. Like who wants to do math like that? <laughs> I mean, I love numbers and I love math and there's everything about math that I love, but I don't want to start a value. I'm a lazy math person. I want to start at zero. Give me round numbers. And, and it also makes it much cleaner on your map when you're using zeros and like, or very simple numbers on your index contours. So never, never, never start your base contour at like some strange number. Just say that the base value is zero for pretty much every map that you will see some listed that say, okay, base, base contour is, you know, maybe 900 meters, but that's because really it started at zero and it went up. So the contour interval is the next thing that's important. And that is the elevation difference between two contour lines. So every, and that is, but it could be between an index contour and an intermediate contour, or it could be in between two intermediate contours 
but there's always going to be an intermediate contour in that contour interval at some point. Okay, so if I go from my index contour to the next line, which is my intermediate contour, and I say my contour interval is two meters, that means that there's going to be a two meter difference between that, those two. So it's always the elevation difference between the two. Not, it has nothing to do with, with horizontal. This is all vertical. This, again, contours are the most common way of representing elevation, and it provides that numerical value to apply calculations. Again, it is only as accurate as your mouse, or if you're using your mouse, or as accurate as your, um, as your ruler, because, again, you might be using a ruler to help identify things, and it's also only about a third of a contour in accuracy. So then we got to think about, with topographic maps, we have bird's eye view versus profile view. So here we have a bird's eye view versus profile. So you see on the side here, on the right hand side, that we have our map with contours. And then we have two points, we have A and B. To go between A and B, if I draw a straight line, I'm going to pass through several contours. So when I'm trying to do a profile, I'm taking like a slice, I'm cutting my map at that point to be able to see a like the change in elevation through a two-dimensional graph or it's really kind of one-dimensional because this is two-dimensional this is one-dimensional so so going from a if i were to draw this out um, actually before i get into that i'm going to give some definitions so bird's eye view is looking down from the top so where maps are or orthometric which means that it's straight down no matter where you look um, we'll talk more about that once we get to photogrammetry, but we're always looking straight down at the points of the map and it gives us this orthometric view, which is like a 90 degree view, no matter where we're looking. A profile view slices the map along a line and plots it in a graph. X axis is the distance along the line and Y axis is the elevation. So this is where scale values become really important, right? Because if I'm using a ruler on a map, I'm not actually getting the distance on the ground my bottom x-axis is distance it it does translate very well okay so if i because i'm using a scale the distance from like for example this first contour to the next contour so from 20 to 30 um, does it matter if i write it down at the bottom of the map in in like meters or kilometers or do I have to do it in, on the map, like which is would be centimeters here? It doesn't really matter that much. It's really just the location of it. So you can see in the profile view, as the values spread out or get more narrow, we see that they're represented as that slope. This is really important. Okay, so if the, t the contours are really close together, you have to show them on the graph that they're really close together. Otherwise, you're just spreading it out and it doesn't actually look like what is there. So that distance on the x-axis is really important. The y-axis is your elevation value, so you're just plotting that. So you can see here, this is what they've done is um, to draw it out has made it very simple. So we, you, they take, for example, a piece of paper and they've drawn out their graph and they actually plot the values of each of the lines based on where it is on that, on that paper where the graph is. So you can do that. That certainly works very well if you are having to do this by hand. Again, um, most of the time now we can go on to Google Earth or something and get these elevation values. In fact, it has a profile option. And um, actually, maybe I'll pull that up. So just give me one second. Let's do this. Google Earth, and I'll just pull it up. Here we go. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom into a place that has lots of elevation change. Let it recover here for a second. Uh, 
I'm still using Landsat images, so it's too remote. There we go. All right. So we keep going in here. So uh, if you go down here, you can see that, you know, you have an image, Landsat, which is a satellite, and then we have, oh, see, it went away now. So now we're into aerial photos. So this is what these two are. So we've got aerial photo. Okay, so here we are. We're in a part of the Rocky Mountains. And we need to, and we want to do a distance, for example. So I'm going to choose a distance. And I get a little window that says path. So I'm going to hit my measurements here and just do a quick, a quick little distance. So I go from, let's say, Peepit Lake. I'm going to go down here. And there's my new path. So I've got, you know, about two, three kilometers. But what is really neat here is that once I name this, I'm going to name it path. That's okay. So I've got that. And then I can go to tools. Sorry, edit, edit, sorry, it goes in edit, and there's my elevation. So I can see it's kind of flat up here because I was going through a lake, <laughs> which should make sense. And then I go down the hill and you can see the change in elevation through that. So this is just merely along that line. So Google Earth has come up with this fantastic um, option in here and, and it tells us the total elevation gain and loss, so we go down uh, 136 meters, we're going up 23.8 at the, the highest increase, which would be down here. And um, yeah, it tells me the distance, it has the distance along the bottom here telling me all that distance. So this is a profile, it's what we can do um, with Google Earth. So if you get, if you download Google Earth, you can definitely give that a try. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint slide. Let's go through here. Go back to contours. So rules for contours. So we went through the the profile, and now we're going to go through rules. So there are there's about 30 rules. Um, most are applied automatically in software, so you don't need to sit there and memorize every single one, but it's a good idea to know a few of them. So again, I have that workbook that I've given you guys um, for activities as part of your, your grade, your participation grade and activity grade. So um, work through those, that, and there's those rules. So number one, contours never cross, except on overhangs. Okay, so you're not going to see them overlapping. They never touch, except at vertical walls. Um, again, these exceptions are really like for mountainous areas or like let's say big ravines, the Grand Canyon, those kinds of things. Uh, contours are always closed on themselves or on the edge of the map. So you're not going to see like suddenly like a contour just dies in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it, it still is there. It always has to close on either itself or the edge. You don't just suddenly like disappear from an elevation. Contours do not cross water bodies. The reason that it doesn't cross water bodies is technically they're flat. So any lake, for example, you're not going to see a lake on an angle because otherwise the water is going to dump out and go to the lower part. So um, water, contours do not cross water bodies. Uh, parallel contours indicate a smooth, flat plane. Often they're man-made. Okay, uh, anything that's a tight contour indicates a steep slope. So the closer they are together, it's a steeper slope. So those are just a few. Um, there's about I think about 20, 15 or 20 on the word scramble, so you can work through those. And um, yeah, so if you ever see an error that comes from this, I'd be able to apply that because sometimes software does have errors in it. So it's always good to double check that. So those are objectives one, um, sorry, 3.1 to 3.3. And here are some references and I suggest going and check them out. So a lot of these are images, but for example, there's no, no, these notes about them. What is a slope? 
uh, you can get a whole ton of information by using these references. I really suggest going to the reference page and just checking it out, clicking where each of these web pages are, because there's lots of information there um, to help you out and teach you new information about what I've just talked about. So I've given you websites, please go to them, check them out, read about what they've, they're talking about on those pages. It'll get, give you greater perspective. All right, so uh, we'll see you in the next objective, which is objectives 3.4 to the end of the to the end of the module.